Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to, to this uh, online chat. Let me start with um, saying that we do have interpretation tonight. So at the bottom of, of your screen, there should be a button that says interpretation where you can select uh, the language channel you would like to listen to. We offer German and English. And I'm going to quickly explain that in German as well. Ein schönen guten Abend allerseits. Willkommen in, in diesem Webinar. Uh, wir bieten simultane Übersetzungen an. Es gibt unten im Menü, sollte es bei euch allen einen Knopf geben mit, uh, bei mir heißt der Interpretation. Uh, ich weiß nicht genau, wer, wer im deutschen Menü heißt Übersetzung mit so einer, mit so einer Weltkugel. Auf die kann man draufklicken und sich seinen äh, Kanal aussuchen, ob man das Ganze auf Englisch oder auf Deutsch oder im Zweifel im Original hören wird. Ähm, ich denke, das meiste heute Abend wird auf Englisch stattfinden. Also sucht euch das aus, äh, wie ihr es gerne hättet. Und sonst technische Fragen gerne in den Chat. Okay, well, the rest is going to be in English uh, from my side for tonight. Uh, Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm so glad uh, to be here today to, to talk about what we all can do against the spreading rule of law crisis on, on this continent. Because we, we indeed, we do have a crisis of the rule of law in the European Union. Uh, we have attacks on free media, on independent judges, on NGOs, on universities in, in a number of member states. Um, we have seen that the situation in many places has gotten worse. Uh, in the pandemic, uh, under under COVID restrictions, uh, some some governments have used uh, the lockdowns and so on to crack down on on the opposition, on free media, and so on. Uh, have taken measures that have nothing to do with um, with protecting against COVID. Let me just mention two examples. For example, making parking free in Budapest clearly has nothing to do uh, with, with um, fighting the, the, the pandemic, uh, fining protesters in, in Slovenia for walking around all by themselves with a protest sign, also not related to, to um, reducing the pandemic. Um, so, so this is just you know, uh, something that uh, we usually know from, from autocracies, but that we have seen right in the middle of the European Union over, over these last few months. Um, I have traveled quite extensively uh, in, in the Union over the last 18 months. I have been in, in many of those countries in the Czech Republic, Bulgaria, Hungary, now uh, last with, with Sergei together and with Francisco, who's joining us in a bit. Uh, we went to Slovenia. And sometimes the situation on the ground can seem a bit grim uh, when, when you see how, how things are developing. But I've had the chance, we have had the chance to also meet some, some really incredible people, uh, young people, um, young protesters that, uh, you know, they create hope. And with their often very creative ways of, um, of voicing their opposition to, to illiberals, to, to autocrats, um, I, for, for me at least, this has been incredibly inspiring. Uh, you know, the, the kind of street protests that, that you guys uh, are, are organizing, the kind of visuals you create, uh, the, the incredible talent you have for, for raising the issues uh, that we all care about to, to a broader attention. So, so I'm very, very glad to be here with you tonight um, so, so that we can, uh, well, share your stories, um, learn from each other. On, uh, on how we all can fight uh, illiberalism uh, in, in Europe and, and beyond, I guess. Uh, so, so, so glad that you joined uh, Sergei, myself and, and, and Francisca. Um, I'm just gonna very briefly gonna say who we have with us uh, tonight. Um, let me start with, um, with Hannah and Pani. Um, who, who both come from the University of Theatre and Film Arts in, in Budapest, the SZFE, um, and, and you both uh, have been quite involved in, in, in the protests, um, you know, to, to keep your university free in, in, in Budapest, and you're going to tell a bit uh, about that in a, in a second. We're also joined tonight uh, by Simona, from, from Bulgaria, 
Um, Simona, I, I, I met you when I visited uh, Sofia uh, late last summer um, when, when the, the protests against uh, Borisov were, were sort of really taking off, uh, protests against corruption, against uh, the rule of law crisis in the, in the country. So looking forward to, to hearing your story as well. And then finally, uh, well, Sergei and I, uh, we both met, met uh, Yasha in, in Slovenia two weeks ago, and we uh, saw each other today here in Strasbourg because we, we uh, brought some of this uh, protest from Slovenia to, to Strasbourg uh, earlier today because um, well, Janis Jansha, the, the prime minister of Slovenia, was in the, in the parliament today. It was the, the, the official uh, opening in the parliament of, of the rotating presidency that Slovenia now has for the next six months. Uh, and, and we wanted to send uh, together a, a message that his voice is not the only voice uh, from, from Slovenia. So thanks so much for, for, for joining and uh, let's, uh, let's start with you guys. Uh, share share uh, your, your story with us. And, and I would say, uh, you know, Pana, uh, Penny and Hannah, if, if, you could, um, if you could start and I'll, uh, no, sorry, we're, we're starting with Simona. Um, I'm getting lost here in the order. Um, and I'm going to try to to show some pictures uh, for, for all of you while you speak so that people can see a little bit uh, what you guys have been, been up to. Uh, Simona, the floor is yours. Hi, so can you hear me? Okay, that's nice. So hello to all of you. Um, the protest here uh, were against the thankfully ex-Prime Minister um, Bojko Borisov, who has been in power since uh, 2009. And his cabinets have seen persistent corruption in all branches of the government. And uh, the result of this was uh, Bulgaria consistently ranking as the most corrupt European Union member in the Corruption Perception Index. Uh, this has been complemented by a steep decline in media freedom. Bulgaria is currently at the 111th position globally in the Press Freedom Index, the lowest score of any EU member. And um, it is very hard to, to say what exactly triggered the protest last year, but we had, uh, thankfully again, ex-Prime Minister Borisov laying uh, half naked on a bed next to a nightstand uh, featuring a handgun and uh, banknotes of uh, 500 euros. Uh, and then an opposition leader reaching the beach residence of, an, of a very prominent uh, oligarch here in Bulgaria, exposing uh, the dark schemes he's involved in. And then the prosecutor general raided the, the office of the president, Truman Radev, who has been very vocal about his dislike for Borisov and his government. And this, uh, this um, prosecutor general was appointed without any competition for that position. So of course we all know about the uh, rule of law crisis here. In and uh, that event probably uh, just uh, triggered the protests for sure. Uh, and uh, protested, uh, the protest started on the 9th of July. The civil organization I represent today, BWET, uh, has been there since day one, and uh, we managed to stay authentic during our participation in the protests. We did not give in to the desire for power. We remained loyal to ourselves and our supporters. Uh, we managed to preserve 100% of our civic will and position. Um, and in addition to protesting and organizing small protest actions outside of the big uh, protests, uh, we did not even stop for a moment uh, filing reports to official reports and signals of abuse and irregular irregularities to the national authorities in Bulgaria and in Europe. Thanks so much, uh, Simona. And next, uh, now I give the floor to, to Pani and Hannah. Um, to, to speak about the situation at the University in Budapest. The floor is yours. Good, good evening, um, and thank you for the invitation. Um, we, here in Hungary, in Budapest, we are uh, protesting against this uh, forceful transformation 
uh, called remodeling by the government that uh, not only affects us, but uh, a lot of uh, other universities and uh, other cultural institutions that were uh, formerly managed by the state. Um, as a result of this remodeling, um, the institutions and their properties are now owned by uh, private foundations uh, run by board of trustees. Um, the members of these uh, boards are appointed uh, undemocratically without any consultation with these communities. Uh, they are running now and uh, they are all uh, closely linked to the proudly illiberal government and their uh, mandates. The board of trustees mandates are uh, valid for lifetimes. Um, the ruling uh, party, Fidesz, is preparing uh, here in Hungary for a possible change of government uh, at next year's elections. Uh, and with this uh, so-called privatization or remodeling uh, of almost the whole higher education and uh, the other cultural institutions, uh, their people would remain in charge of uh, all these public properties, the institutions and the wealth and everything. Yes, and uh, we started our protests in last summer when the bill was passed in the parliament, which was uh, managed this kind of remodeling system uh, in our, within our university. And the events led to that we, in the first week of September, first uh, day of September, we occupied our university building. And uh, not only the students were participate in this action, but only the teachers of the university and also some staff members as well. Um, during our protests, we are very direct uh, statement was that we don't want to involve in party politics. So we asked every uh, political party to stay away from our cause because it's a much bigger uh, cause than these little power plays. Um, and uh, our, our protest was very transparent. Uh, we occupied the university uh, for uh, 71 days and in November in the middle of November we had to move out from the building because it was a huge um, lockdown because of the pandemic so we had to stop now uh, right then but until that we organized many demonstrations and many events in which we uh, we involved the civil society and they participated very actively, not just by attending to these demonstrations, but we organized some kind of demonstrations as a life chain or relay run where the event couldn't be uh, realized without their participants. We also got a very big amount of uh, support from the public donations as well and they also helped us organize our public events um, and we managed to uh, move ten thousands of people in in the capital and also in the countryside we organized other uh, demonstrations as well uh, there was a memorial day in october uh, the 23rd of october it's a revolution memorial day in hungary against the communist dictatorship and on that day we organized a big protest where other um, university students joined to organize and trade unions and healthcare workers as well uh, sadly our protest uh, ended in november and right now our university is ruled by a different management half of the students and the teachers and also the staff left the university and this remodeling went through but we uh, founded uh, an association free sfa association where we uh, keep going our uh, studies and our art works and cultural cultural work as well and we also protest against this yeah with the support of a lot of uh, european uni universities that are uh, administratively help us uh, in this uh, program with the association. Yeah, so the students who were who left it, the university, they have the possibility to end their studies in this university. Also staying in Hungary at the same time and 
learning from their teachers. Yes. Thanks so much uh, for for sharing, uh, Yasha. Um, if 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 you want to speak uh, about what you have done in in Slovenia. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, in last year, in March, in Slovenia, we were at the same time hit by two viruses. So one was this COVID that everybody is familiar with, but the other virus is this virus of Janez Janša and his government which immediately in March, when they took over, they started to attack the freedom of the press. They started to uh, put uh, their people in all positions of power. They started to undermine the rule of law. There was corruption scandals coming out and so on. So it became clear already in the first two weeks that uh, the government is going away from a kind of a relatively normal democracy with normal levels of corruption towards a kind of totalitarian system which is much closer to let's say Hungary or some other countries uh, and uh, yeah immediately people started to self-organize first when the, it was the height of the first uh, wave of the COVID epidemic people were protesting from balconies and making individual actions uh, and just like we were using uh, the right to recreation to run around the city with some posters and then uh, within a few weeks, there was this uh, initiative to have protests on bicycles because it was allowed to drive with bicycles. So there was, uh, there started first with a few hundred bicycles in the main city, then it spread to a few thousand bicycles. And then pretty soon there was uh, bicycling protests in all the major cities of Slovenia. People driving around, keeping safety distance with masks, etc., uh, protesting for early elections basically to to kind of uh, resolve and against corruption and against the attacks on the free media and so on. Uh, this uh, protests have now been going on each Friday uh, for more than 60 weeks. So for more than 60 weeks we've been on the streets and we have faced a lot of repression from the police, even these individual actions, for example, just like putting individually paper footsteps on the floor uh, people were getting fines of 400 euro per person for this kind of things. Here you can see an image of somebody reading the constitution of Slovenia being dragged off by uh, police in full riot gear. Uh, so this police repression has been a, a common thing, of course, under the excuse that uh, this is COVID measurements, although we have always kept safety distance, used masks, etc. cetera, um, but we have continued to fight on. Uh, there is even a network of uh, lawyers and uh, legal experts that have self-organized as a kind of network for the protection of democracy, which is now representing us as protesters. Um, during this whole time, there is a whole media machinery owned by the government of, uh, I mean, owned by the ruling party, which is attacking us as individuals. But yeah, somehow we have managed to reinvent different actions from protesting in bicycles to protesting in cars uh, to making kind of unexpected kind of soft, we call them like soft guerrilla terrorist actions of kind of undermining the politicians and using humor and so on and managed to keep this protest going. And the last major protest that we had was uh, uh, less than a month ago where there was uh, of almost 40,000 people participating so it's still the protests are still going strong trade unions have joined us and and so on and yeah we are trying to keep it alive reinvent it and hopefully uh, outlast the government in this fight thanks yasha um we, we will go now through through three sort of areas where where we wanted to to ask you some questions and uh, and and see if there there is also any further comments from you uh, and we will then open it up uh, for for questions uh, from from everyone so if if any one of you wants to ask a question uh, please put it in the in the q a um at the at the bottom of the screen uh, again there's a button uh, for for questions and answers where you can type your questions and then uh, we we will ask them to to all the participants um, you can ask questions to to sergey myself uh, to any of the activists uh, everything is possible but we we wanted to start out i mean given that, that both Sergei and I sit in the, in the European Parliament, uh, basically the, the first question that we would have to all of you 
what would you expect from from us uh, how can we help what would you expect uh, from the european parliament from the eu institutions more uh, more broadly is that something that you have even uh, considered in, in in your protests how how do you see this uh, what's what's the role of um, you know the rest of europe in 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 your struggles that that might seem somewhat um, somewhat local yet we we see sort of so many similarities of of the uh, of the actions of of governments across the different countries so so it would be great to hear a bit uh, what what you expect and uh, how how we could help i don't know who who wants to start Yeah, maybe I can I can uh, start since uh, one. It's uh, very clear that uh, Slovenia is now uh, taking the role as the in the presidency of the uh, European Parliament. Uh, so in this time, especially the eyes of the European media and the foreign media are much more on us, and it's definitely useful to have uh, foreign media, foreign politicians, foreign decision makers. Uh, actively involved in questioning the, the practices and, and exposing the practices of the government. Uh, so this is very useful. Uh, but yeah, I would say even one step further, there should be a kind of, uh, I mean, I speak for myself as somebody who voted uh, to enter into the European Union that for me, the primary reason to enter the European Union was the fact that uh, we believe that it's um, an organization that is based on democracy and rule of law and freedom of speech. And if these uh, rules are not being uh, um, taken care of in a country, I think it's the duty of European Union to take a very strong stand on this and demand that these basic rights and basic ideas are being followed. So uh, we would be uh, very grateful for any also concrete actions, measures with or with withholding funds or with official letters of uh, uh, kind of uh, ordering the government, for example, like it's in the situation with the Slovenian press agency, which hasn't got funding for more than half a year, or with the prosecutors, which should have been appointed, but they don't want to appoint them because they're afraid of exposing their own corruption. So we would like as, as strong actions as possible. And, and yeah, also these kind of events are, of course, helpful. Thanks. I don't know, Simona? Yes, I wanted to add something. So autocratic rule means that the EU le legitimized the, these leaders, as we can see that uh, some of the largest state dis disbursements are going to these authoritarian regimes. And uh, this is an environment that lacks accountability and uh, autocrats redirect these uh, these large amounts of money uh, at their own efforts for retaining power. So, for example, rule of law uh, conditionality for funding, that seemed like a good idea. But uh, I can tell you what happens in Bulgaria every year after there is some uh, report about the rule of law or from the, the monitoring of uh, judicial uh, reforms from the European Commission. Uh, we hear the same problem every year for now 14 years, ever since Bulgaria has been a member of the European Union. And uh, do we really need to hear the same reports every year? Uh, these are the exact same problems every time. And I do not want to sound uh, radical, but unless we start uh, hearing names, uh, we start having um, effective, uh, I mean, fair trials ending in effective sentences, Again, not to sound radical, um, there is nothing really we can do. I, I, I don't think asking for, you know, courts that work and that uh, do, do their job, that that is radical in, 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 in any way. I, I, it, it should be the most normal thing in the, in the world, right? Uh, Pani and Hannah, any, anything you, you want to say, uh, what you would expect or what we could do? Yeah, well, well, Hungary <clears throat> got famous again these days with the uh, LGBTQ plus uh, rights, the restrictions of them, I guess. So leaders uh, of uh, Europe had stated that uh, as, uh, uh, 
a country like Hungary shouldn't be in the EU, but we are we, we want to tell that uh, these uh, laws are not representing the people of uh, Hungary. Unfortunately, we want to be in the EU. Um, uh, only we, we we are thinking of things like how we were thinking how can the EU um, help, uh, and we think if there's uh, some possibilities. Uh, to uh, for, for NGOs of Hungary and the uh, grassroots uh, organizations uh, to be uh, financed directly, um, raising these possibilities uh, would be nice. For example, because the uh, government spends uh, the money, they get how they want to, and not how uh, people of Hungary want it. Yeah, and it's it's a very bad conflict that our our government is punished by the EU, but. Of course, because we have that government, the uh, people of the people of Hungary will be punished as well. And so the biggest conflict in that that the people it, it doesn't so the will of the government don't really matches with the wants of the of the people. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, when uh, I, uh, I was one of those that, that negotiated this new uh, rule of law conditionality, and one of the things that we in the parliament particularly insisted on is that, you know, the, the, the punishment should not hit the wrong people, right, that uh, it should not be those ordinary citizens that, of course, are entitled and should get uh, the, the money the, the way that it is foreseen, right? What we see is that too often the, the, the money doesn't get where, where it's supposed to be. Um, and, and, you know, for, 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 for that, uh, I mean, that's, that's what this rule of law conditionality is, is, is supposed to do, uh, to cut the funding to those that are not supposed to get it, but to ensure that those that are entitled to the funds still, still can receive it. Of, of course, this won't be immediately and always possible to do it this way because oftentimes the structures are very complex uh, there in, in lots of member states there have been very uh, elaborate systems set up with shell companies and, and whatnot and oftentimes the EU doesn't seem to know really who actually gets gets this money right at, at the end of the day uh, so so those are some of the things that that we struggle with but I I heard you loud and clear uh, saying, you know, the, the, this debate that I guess uh, Mark Rutte, the Dutch Prime Minister, launched, suggesting that that Hungary uh, should should leave the union, um, that that is 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 not the answer, uh, but that uh, we should rather solve those issues in inside the union rather than punishing a, a population that that isn't responsible for what government is is doing in all cases. Um, Thanks a lot. I'm uh, going to hand it over to uh, to Sergey, basically for the second uh, topic. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you, Daniel, also for this introduction and 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 holding this uh, this event together. Um, uh, uh, welcome uh, from my side also to all our guests. It's a, a great pleasure to see you because you know talking to politicians um, is one thing, but um, Talking to the real heroes of the of the times is is a different one, and I consider everyone who is courageous enough, um, sometimes maybe to be radical, <laughs> like Simona, you know, is trying not to be, but we know that uh, it it takes a lot of courage to make proposals like that. Uh, we wanted to take a step back a little bit before we go to kind of the practical things, which I think are important, but also to to kind of analyze a little bit what what has been happening during this year this this especially this COVID year and some of you already mentioned um, the kind of the opportunities that uh, the COVID situation has given to our little autocrats uh, in uh, Sofia or in, in in Budapest or in in Ljubljana uh, or in many other countries of the of the European Union and we wanted to focus on this a little bit uh, I'm a member of the uh, 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 um, uh, group which is monitoring rule of law in the uh, Committee for Justice uh, of the Parliament. And during the COVID crisis, we met once or twice a week because we knew something is going on and some authoritarians are using this time uh, to kind of rebuild uh, their situation. So we had emergency laws, 
uh, we had problems with separation of powers. But when we talk to Yasha and to um, uh, to many other uh, others in Ljubljana, this was an important point also for civil society, uh, where political rights, uh, also surveillance. Um, was was increased and political rights were defeated and there was a problem with freedom of speech as well because in many cases uh, this was used to kind of stifle uh, the political freedom for many in the civil society. We wanted to give you an opportunity maybe to describe this. Yash already started but um, maybe uh, uh, to you Pani and Hanna, um, how did you experience the time uh, of the COVID measures in, in, in Budapest and Hungary. Was, it, was there something special about that? Did you feel that you, you had especially um, much um, pressure uh, under the pretext of, of, of COVID uh, measures in, in Hungary? Yes, um, since the beginning of the pandemic in Hungary, there is a state of emergency and the government rules by decrees. So there would be, so there was a lot of bills which has passed without any democratic oversight in Hungary. Um, and uh, since November to, to June, there was also the restriction of the free assembly in Hungary. So we couldn't protest uh, make, and make, make demonstrations. And there was, in, in the end of April, there was the time when the terraces of the public places opened and people could gather and drink and be together and hang out. And after that, only after a half a, and one and a half months was when people were allowed to protest. So it's a big, big, big restriction of, of uh, fun, fundamental laws and rights. Yeah, this is precisely what we expected. Apani, did you want to, to add something? Because I, yeah. I saw you. Yeah, just, just a bit. Uh, they are absolutely misusing uh, this power that uh, ruling by decrees means. Um, uh, concerning, for example, these uh, private foundations that we uh, were telling about and the uh, LGBTQ plus rights and uh, the, the free press, uh, for example, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a new rule uh, that uh, spreading fake news is uh, now punished by law, but judges are not independent in Hungary. Um, there's also uh, making healthcare workers' lives uh, more difficult um, by uh, uh, obligatory making them uh, to work where they are sent to, uh, far from their families. And the state of emergency is extended, extended now until autumn of uh, 2021, uh, despite uh, the government seized all uh, COVID related restrictions and uh, they are communicating a huge success in vaccination. So we don't really understand uh, why state of emergency is still uh, happening. Uh, uh, th th thank you. Th 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 that's precisely what, what I was suspected. Yasha, when we were in Slovenia, you told us uh, about your particular situation and you already started describing it. I know that you have a lot of um, um, if I may disclose this, a lot of financial pressure also, because anything you were doing publicly and politically uh, cost money during the COVID times. Um, is this kind of the new type of uh, uh, exerting pressure on civil society? How did you uh, and how do you feel about that? Um, because as far as I understand, you're still affected by this. Oh, yeah, it's it's quite absurd how how hard the government has tried to also with financial pressures with punishing people has tried to uh, stop protests from happening uh, in several of this corona package laws they were actually part of the laws was uh, specifically raising uh, the 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 uh, fines for for any kind of uh, gathering but it was like uh, this description of gathering was so broad that basically anything that the police has decided that this gathering can be said to be gathering we had a situation in december where we had four people with umbrellas walking with a distance of five meters around the city which is the same exact thing that other people were doing as well but the moment they got in the square in front of the parliament because on the umbrellas there was some slogans they got fined or they, they uh, said told to them that they got they would get fined and the most absurd thing was at that time even the policeman who came to them 
told them quite directly. He didn't mean to be so direct, but he said, but don't you know, it's not, it's not legal. It's illegal to express yourself politically in these times. And, and that's when we realized that it, it went so far that even the police, even though there was a kind of surface layer where it was supposed to be about uh, keeping people safe about COVID, which, as I said, we were always having measure, measures of, of uh, keeping safety distance and so on. It became to the point that even the police considered it quite normal to punish people just for the fact that they are speaking uh, um, publicly. Personally, I have received over yeah, 10,000 euros in fines in the last year. And uh, yeah, a lot of these fines were paid with like voluntary contributions on the protest. And I'm not the only one who has, uh, but I'm got more because I'm more exposed. Um, but we also now we have this network of lawyers which are uh, appealing the fines and also went to the Constitutional Court in Slovenia, which actually then found that all of these fines that were given out were actually uh, going against the Constitution of Slovenia. Despite this, the government is still proceeding. They are changing the law now in order to make it constitutional to give these fines, and they did not return the, the, the money to anybody who got this fine and this who already paid the fine. Uh, so yeah. Quite so, so it's, it's quite a quite a manifest way of, of exerting pressure on anyone who just, you know, basically is trying to make a public political contribution um, and something that doesn't stop after the COVID uh, measures, the hard COVID measures stop. Uh, Simona, maybe maybe a question to you and to, to many of you. Uh, of course, we, we are talking about this very uh, clear manifest in, infringement of uh, political rights in, in many of, the, the, of your countries, of our countries. Um, but do you see any other effect of the COVID times? I mean, for us, for example, in the parliament, it was important that uh, when we're talking about the recovery money that is going to the countries now, you know, the money, the COVID money, that part of it should be secured for civil society uh, because it's not just for businesses and it's not just businesses who suffered uh, throughout the COVID. We, we want also NGOs to be supported from this public money that is being distributed now. Um, do you have, uh, uh, Simona, do you have any kind of, do you see any effect of COVID for NGOs that they're, you know, trying to survive now? Is it more difficult uh, to survive for civil society uh, during and after the COVID times, just purely for financial reasons? So, um, to be honest with you, I don't think that COVID restrictions were a hurdle to the protests and uh, the civil organizations here or the NGOs, as there uh, aren't any established ones in Bulgaria. That's, this is not a prominent thing here. Um, and to be honest with you, uh, the, the discussion about the EU funding uh, for COVID uh, restoration um, isn't taking place publicly, as we are in a very uh, tense moment. We are pre-second elections right now, mm -hmm. and um, th this is just not a discussion here. So interesting, yeah. Well, that, it is. Uh, that shows how different different the contexts are. But what about what about Budapest? What about what about Hungary? Yeah, so the latest decree of, of our government is, uh, was made last week, and it says that every uh, NGOs have to name their donators above 1,500 uh, euros. So they obligated to give the names of the donators. So That's, that's incredible. And that's ironic because um, we can still not know for sure where the 4 million euros coming from Hungary to Slovenia and pouring into the media are exactly coming from. So, so there is no transparency for that money uh, uh, flowing into kind of a pro-governmental media, but every cent and every euros uh, for NGOs have to be accountable at some, at some point in some way or another. I will pause here because we have uh, uh, divided the topics between the three of us. And now maybe you can, um, you know, we can develop this topic later during the Q&A, but we wanted to focus now on the kind of the practical aspects of mobilizing in, in the difficult times that we're having now. And uh, Francisca Brandner, who is a member of the Bundestag, member of the German parliament uh, from the Greens, who is online, I don't see her now. I'm now here. I'm, we hear you, uh, your camera is off. 
Yes, but I have bad internet. I'm in the south of Germany. We have election campaign, and unfortunately, if I turn on my camera, it will be too bad. So well, Germany, the high tech country. <laughs> does not even let us to, <laughs> to see you. Uh, uh, Francisca, I will hand over to you. Uh, and uh, please, you have the floor. Welcome here. And it's great that the three of us are joining forces uh, for this event. Francisca. No, thank you very much. And I'm very honored to be with you. And I'm, 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 I heard today that you have many people now participating already in voting on your referendum, which I think is fantastic news that you have, you know, people willing to express your opinion on that referendum and I hope it will help you um, uh, and it will be a success. So my Francisca, question, you mean just just to clarify, you mean the referendum in Slovenia uh, because water. we haven't oh yes we haven't sorry, talked, haven't about, talked about, about, about yes there is a referendum on water privatization on the shores of lakes etc access to lakes. So it's quite an important uh, referendum taking place that started um, with early voting. Um, and I hope that many citizens of Slovenia will participate because the date was also put at the moment when uh, Slovenia is already on holidays. Um, so many people are not there to vote and it looks like many people go for early voting. That's what I wanted to say. Um, sorry for that. Um, but it links to my question in terms of, you know, how do you organize, how is your impact um, and also what kind of new tools and ways do you use? And uh, of course, you know, what kind of support could help you in your work? Um, Yasha, why don't you want to start? Uh, yeah, okay, sure. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's connecting also to one of the previous questions. I, I was thinking now about this and I realized that actually the, the funny paradox in Slovenia that uh, we have a lot of NGOs, which are theoretically exactly should be dealing with questions of, uh, you know, encouraging direct democracy, encouraging citizen participation, and so on, uh, making kind of active uh, citizenship uh, initiatives and so on. And the funny thing is that throughout this whole last year, these organizations have been mostly silent. Why? Because the, the money that they get is largely distributed through the government, through the systems of the government, and there is this fear present because Slovenia is such a small country, etc. I'm sure it's similar also in other countries, that in fact, this organization that you would expect would be the loudest in this situation, or the ones who are very quiet because they're afraid of of getting their funding cut. Also, as uh, when we were discussing on how to, for example, finance campaigns such as this one for the referendum for water, it's it's very difficult for us to, to, to get any kind of funds because we should somehow go through the government or should we should go through the NGO organizations, which are all in Slovenia, unfortunately, also environmental agents, uh, organizations are extremely afraid to uh, take any stance which is directly uh, directed towards the, the actions of the government. And it's a, it's a huge problem, actually, that, that there is a kind of failure of the system, which was exactly meant to be kind of a supportive mechanism for this democracy to function in, in countries. Um, uh, the other thing, what we are doing, what is working, is we are utilizing social media, we are the whole protest in Slovenia started through Facebook, uh, through uh, making events on Facebook, through sharing videos on Facebook, uh, through people contacting through Messenger directly each other. And, and basically, there is a, this loose alliance of people, a lot of artists also involved. And we try to kind of uh, come up with ideas, come up with images, with graphics, with uh, there's like a kind of crowdsourcing of, of ideas that's going on all the time and sharing and a kind of virtual community that's built. One of the pages uh, on Facebook has 80,000 members in Slovenia, which is very much involved in the protest. And that for Slovenia is a huge amount of members. And it's kind of like a hub from where then different initiatives can start and information can be shared and so on. So, so this is I would say one one quite important way how we manage uh, to do things. Yeah, thank you. Maybe somebody else wants to come in, Simona. Maybe Simona, you can say about what you expect from what kind of help would you like to get. Um, so I'll start just answering your question. The big challenge here was not to be influenced by the, the fake news, by the media that the oligarch uh, controlled and pro-government uh, media spewed. 
uh, the protesters. Uh, we also had uh, paid protesters by the government who were brought by buses from all over Bulgaria and made counter protests. So, of course, for, for a start, we would like uh, we would like fair media representing what we really wanted. Um, um, as uh, some months passed by, the attendance in the squares uh, decreased, but the tension in social media uh, never stopped. And uh, fortunately, uh, thematic protests uh, continued, uh, such as the one in front of the courtroom every Wednesday, and uh, the protest that uh, the organization I represent, WET, organizes almost every Friday in front of the national television. What we do is that we copy the uh, TV show that is on the national television. And of course, there are, um, of course, some really, Okay, let's say government close uh, politicians there, but what we talk about uh, in our version is the real problems and uh, everything that is happening during the week or something like that. So of course, yes, we use the, the power of social media and that's, this is our um, most important weapon. And Hannah, maybe you can answer me, what kind of help would you think could be useful for your work? So right now we uh, we have uh, the most of our work in in the association, free SFO association, and we need money to start our projects. So these are cultural activities, and yeah. So we could uh, we were lucky because we are a uh, art school, so we could grab the attention of the media. Uh, quite easily. Uh, we had a clear statement. We built our protest uh, on like the phrase uh, autonomy and uh, a lot of people could uh, connect to it. Uh, so that, that's how we um, reached uh, the civil society. We tried to communicate transparently uh, and, um, and we had a clear demand, but then we like failed because now uh, the university is uh, taken over by the government and a lot of universities are taken over by the government so now it seems like like um, except except five universities i guess uh, all of all of the formerly state owned governments are now um, let me so i want to explain that if if she says government it doesn't mean that the government yes yeah, state, yeah, state, but, state but these these group of five people, these trustees who are appointed by the government, but they're, if, if there's a governmental change, they will still stay there at the heads, at the heads of these universities. Yeah, so it seems like uh, for us and everyone uh, who are taken over in Hungary, that uh, more and more institutions year by year, uh, the, the only chance for us is uh, um, to uh, mobilize the society and uh, get the nations from from civils so there's nothing else we can do and how do you reach the population that is not yet um so much on social media um because i think that's uh, still an important part when it comes to having impact and how do you build bridges to other actors or citizens that are maybe not yet convinced i'm like how do you build bridges to enlarge and get more people to support your um, work? Well, as we told, your well, chance. Well, as we told, uh, we, we like, um, when we had this big protest last October, we, uh, we reached um, uh, trade unions and healthcare workers and uh, other university students to uh, get on the stage where the attention was. So we tried to mobilize um, most of society through them, I guess. And it was also, I mean, during the occupation, it was also a big uh, power that we were there and many, many people came to us. I mean, people from the streets and asked about our case, about us. So they were very informed. And it we was also, visible. We were visible, we were there, we were transparent and we also organized uh, demonstration on the countryside um, and we have the luck that we have very well-known actors and they yeah, also yes. raised awareness and people who are the older generation from the older generation they they listen to them 
right now it's a problem that we aren't there anymore i mean at the university but yeah it's very difficult because in hungary the government the, the state media is controlled by the government so it's only only a few independent media are yeah actually. and mostly on the internet yes Thank you very much. Um, I hand over now because we have now an open round of Q&A. So thank you already for these answers. And you know, let us know whenever we can help. Thanks, Francisca. Um, Yasha, you, you raised your hand, but let me ask the, the first question to you as well. And then you can complement uh, with, with anything you wanted to say. We had a question from, from Nikolai. Uh, who, who basically ask, well, things have been going so well in Slovenia. How did this happen? Uh, how, how did Jansha come to power? And, and also that question of, had there been any problems in the country uh, before uh, he took power again last year? Uh, yeah, so first of, of all, I just wanted to add to the, the previous question that for us, just as an experience for anybody who wants to organize protests, it's really shown to be quite valuable in countries that still have some normal free press is to write these press releases and to take uh, really attention to put out a press release every time we do a kind of protest and write very good copy is a, is a kind of way that also in today's time the media it likes very much to just copy paste stuff that you send them so it's a kind of good channel to also get our message to a wider audience outside of just of social media to put attention on kind of trying to build the relationship with the, the media that is also feeling this pressure at the moment uh, the other question of how we came to this point yeah we're also a bit shocked and surprised for the last 30 years we kind of mostly had this kind of a big center-left government we had problems with corruption, but not so much. I think a lot of us, and especially civil society, was kind of sleeping and not putting too much attention on the, the situation, political, like day-to-day -day political situation. Uh, but in this time, Janis Jansha in the background, like in this Lord of the Rings, you know, the, the powers of the dark are getting stronger. And suddenly uh, he managed to basically convince two members of two of the political parties, which promised before the regular elections in 2018, that they promised that they will not go into coalition with Janis Jansha, because this was very important to people, that the parties should promise this, because 70% of people don't want Janis Jansha to be the prime minister, because we had him once, and there was also mass protest then in 2013. Um, and they broke this promise, and they decided that for them it's more important to stay another two years in their warm parliamentary seats than to risk these early elections. And that's how this whole situation got started, even though normally on a regular uh, election, Janis Jansha could never gather enough votes or enough support to form a coalition. But since this happened in the last year, I personally, and we all are getting shocked every week or every two weeks, we are still getting shocked by how fast a country can go from a kind of a relatively normal democracy into a place where really you feel that people are afraid you feel that like there is becoming this kind of uh, alternative reality in which this media you know this uh, politicians can just say whatever they want even if it's clearly a lie and nobody dares to call them on it and and yeah it's it's really shocking how fast this this switch can happen and that's why also we are so active and so worried because we see it getting worse from from week to week I have a question for, for Pani and Hannah from Frank, um, who, who is asking, and I, and I think Franziska already pointed a bit in, into that direction, but how big is the support for, um, for these kind of protests in Hungary beyond the university cities? And also the question, you know, if, if with the next election there, is a ch there would be a change of government, how, how much hope is there? Uh, what what can be turned back and uh, particularly you know on on your very concrete case of this university um, could could a different government um, solve solve the issue uh, well um, um, the amount of people uh, supporting us here in Hungary was a big amount uh, According to the COVID restrictions, it was like uh, I think thirty thousand uh, of um, 
people were on our biggest, on our hugest protest, uh, demonstration uh, in a two million uh, uh, capital. Uh, it, it, it was a lot, uh, I think. Um, and other universities, uh, students uh, all around the country uh, were joining. Um, and they had their own uh, demonstrations uh, in other university towns uh, and they could mobilize uh, the town's uh, people also. Yeah, but it's it's hard to say because, you know, that time there was the, the another big news, it's, it's COVID and the pandemic and people were, were dealing with that. But I think, which is a huge problem, positive thing then in the Hungarian media two big topics were during our occupation COVID and our okay. occupation yeah. so of course as any other protest it, it hit big in the capital and among people from the capital but it also went to to people from from little towns and we had this yellow masks with the hands i don't know whether you saw it or not but it was kind of a symbol of of our protest and a lot of people wore these masks but bought these masks for uh, from us and also wore these after until someone got attacked on a bus by uh, a um, activist of the government yeah someone wore these masks it was a woman and she was attacked by a man aggressively, her face was cut. Um, yes. Yeah. I don't know if we uh, answered the question yes. or not. The first one, yes. Uh, the the question on hope after the elections, uh, if you know uh, how how much could be um, could be repaired with a different government. It's it's a big topic uh, within the opposition as well. So how big damage did the government did and how they can change it but after if, if they will rule but yeah but they are now saying that uh, some rules that were uh, that were made by a uh, two to third majority of uh, this government which is not really a two to third majority it's just a bit of a variated uh, uh, election uh, laws uh, so, some rules that are uh, m made with this two to third majority are not uh, are not obligated to being made by that. So, uh, opposition doesn't need two to third majority to uh, make them um, to change. I'm not sure, I don't know. Yeah, 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 to change them. Yes, but there are also fears that a lot of uh, state property was given out in private hands so yeah uh, it's a fear that thousand of, of billions of private property i mean foreign thousand of billions of foreign so it's a big discussion topic in hungary how much it can be changed and how much yeah and repaired yeah thanks so much for those answers um simona i have a question from from venelin who is asking if if ngos from different countries can can help each other more uh, if, if there's more room uh, I guess for for NGOs also for organizations like like yours to to collaborate across borders is is that an avenue that would help I think that that is an amazing idea I haven't heard of something like this happening or at least not in Bulgaria um yes that that would help that would be very uh, interesting to see and very beneficial to the causes in the different countries as of course uh, every exposure is very important so yes that, that's a great idea but I don't know the specifics of it or the logistics because I haven't heard of something like this uh, happening okay um well i from my side uh i i, I would close the, the round of questions uh to to you guys and basically ask uh, sergey and um and francisca if uh, what, what are you taking away from this um what what, uh, what what do we make of this all francisca do you want to start 
or should I? I can I can start. Um, I mean, first of all, it's it's um, it's totally important that we talk about those issues and that 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 actually the affected people come out and 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 talk to others because I know so many uh, uh, who you know live quite comfortable lives somewhere in in the German towns or cities and enjoy the freedoms and the liberties and it's not perfect but we sometimes I have a feeling we live in a different um, in different worlds and we are so separated even though it's just a hundred kilometers away uh, the border so we we need to start talking to each other more um, and and then and then many of people and I hope that many who have joined us today and that there were about 100 people on the constant more than 100 um, have taken something away uh, and learned about how the realities are elsewhere um, I, I as a as a politician now I, I took away uh, a determination, a take with me determination to fight for what we're doing. And Daniel, if I may use this uh, to, uh, to just to mention, um, uh, there is the the project that I have. I call it the New Era Foundation, uh, New Era Legislation, uh, uh, European Right of Association Era. Uh, it's a package of uh, initiatives to strengthen. Uh, civil pan-European civil society and to build, to give an opportunity to have European NGOs, not just national NGOs. Simona just mentioned it, how important it would be to work across borders. That we can do and we can legislate and, and regulate, even though the, I hate this word regulate, but giving people, empower people uh, uh, to work together. This is something we're working on and Daniel is working in his field and Francisca and hers and myself are working on that. So I, I take a lot of motivation and anyone who's interested in that, get in touch. Uh, and uh, thanks for the organizers, you know, the co-organizers who have hosted this event. Thanks, Daniel, for the idea and to your team. Um, thank you as well. But I would, uh, if you allow, I would make two thoughts. First of all, I would like to ask um, Olivia in the chat, um, uh, who wrote about Facebook, Olivia Virag, to send me more details about this because we can confront Facebook with that too. So I would be very happy to pick this up with the Facebook government people in, in Germany. Um, so please go ahead and send me more detailed information of what precisely is uh, has been changing. Uh, I would be happy to follow up on this. Um, Second part, it was a question, you know, what is an, an alternative to authoritarianism like digital democracy, civic assemblies, referendums? I believe that we can and must revitalize our representative democracy. I don't see the future in a purely direct democracy, you know, everything by referendum, etc. But I think that we can add really new elements to a representative democracy like uh, you know citizens council um like in ireland where you draw them um you know so that you have a really representative slice of your society in those councils working over a longer period of time with experts on questions that are of matter to citizens um so i think you know in belgium we do it in my state of Baden-Württemberg, there are many new ways how you can invigorate and have more citizens participate uh, um, without giving up on a representative democracy. Uh, it's not that it's here the citizens and there the government. You know, I think if we have to make government work better for citizens and citizens be able to participate and be active in it. And what I take from it for me again is that the appeasement politics of the conservative EPP now with um, Yancha is so dangerous and it's exactly the same wrong and false strategy that they had with Orban for over years and I hope that we can have that we can contribute to adding pressure of saying you know you can't repeat the same mistakes that you have done with Orban of hugging them um, not being openly critical of them and hoping that they will become better one day. They just don't. They just um, will benefit from it, will get richer, make their friends richer, uh, and continue destroying democracy. So I hope that we will be strong enough to make that case and thereby also help sustain democracy. It's In the end, it's in their hands, but we can add some pressure.
Thanks so much. Um, thanks, uh, guys, for, for sharing your stories. Uh, we will try, Sergei, Francisca, and I, at, at our levels to, to make sure uh, that, that the European Union does its, its share uh, in, in protecting your, your rights, your, your freedoms, also all of our taxpayer money, of course, um, where, wherever that's appropriate. We can't fix everything. Uh, I, I don't promise that this goes too fast, but at least we keep up the pressure and uh, we will Definitely. tell your stories uh, to uh, to those that, that have the possibilities to, to change something in, in, in all of the member states. Um, we're fighting, of course, in particular at the moment uh, that this new tool that we fought for for so long uh, this rule of law conditionality mechanism gets gets used uh, for for the first time in a, in a very long time. We're we're taking the commission to court uh, over this, so uh, be be assured at least that the European Parliament is is taking the situation really seriously, and uh, and we are trying uh, everything that we can to uh, to to do something about it. But but you are as we as we said tonight, you're you're the real heroes on the ground. Uh, that, that are fighting this. Um, so, so keep up that fight. Let us know if, if there's anything that we can do. Uh, and thanks for, for being here and sharing your story. And I want to uh, give a quick shout out to Florian as well from my office, uh, who brought us all together here tonight uh, and, and did all this work. So thanks a lot. And uh, if any of the questions remained unanswered tonight, don't hesitate. Uh, Sergei, Francisca and I more than happy to, to answer those, send us emails or contact us on social media. And uh, thanks everyone and see you next time. Bye-bye.